in our hearts and lives. There is no one who is like Jesus, no one that can compare to the Lord Jesus. We worship Him with all that we are and all that we have. If you would take your Bibles this morning, we are in Colossians chapter 3. If you turn there, I invite you to do that and find verse number 12. We'll pick up where we left off last week. Last week, if you were here, we looked at the subject of things that you should put off. We talked about what we should put off in our lives. Those things related to our old nature. Do you remember that? Our old nature includes those things like sexual sins. We are to reject sexual sins, things like sexual immorality and lust and greed and impure thoughts. But not only that, our old nature includes social sins, and we are to reject those as well, things like anger, rage, resentment, slander, and filthy language. Why should we reject those things? Well, those things characterized who we were before Christ. Those things also controlled our lives. You see, before coming to faith in Christ, before we were saved, before we were transformed, we were sinners and all we could do was sin. We were controlled by our sin. But today we're going to look at things that you should put on because what you put on is as important as the things that you put off. You see, every time you remove something from your life, there's a void that's created. And if you don't take action to fill that void with something, somebody else will. Or something else will fill that void in your life. So as we put off those sexual and social sins, we need to put on And we should put on the Lord Jesus, is what Paul tells us in Romans 13, verse 14. He says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in order to fulfill its lusts in your life. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? And maybe another question is, what does that look like? What does it look like to put on the Lord Jesus? Do you go to your closet and you pull out a suit or a shirt or a pair of pants or whatever and put him on? Well, maybe it's kind of like that. But let's look at, as Paul describes for us, what it means to put on the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 12, and I want you to notice, first of all, in the new man, which we've become in Christ, the clothes that we are to wear. The new man's clothes. In verse 12, we read, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Verse 12 begins with the word, therefore. And so we need to consider that for a reason because it has application. Therefore reminds us of what's happened in our lives. Therefore is there to remind us of the change that has taken place in Christ in your life and in my life by grace through faith. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul reminds us that we were by nature children of wrath. We were born that way. We were born with a sin nature. We were born as sinners. We didn't need a course to indoctrinate us on what does that mean and how do you do that and what does that look like. We came fully equipped to be sinners. That's how we were born. Each one of us inherited that from our earthly fathers. All the way back to Adam and Eve. This was a trait that has been inherited all through the generations of mankind. We were all born with a sin nature. And under this old nature, we were enslaved and we were, in, we were controlled by sin. And last week we looked at sins like sexual sins, social sins that we just looked at in verses 5 and verse 8. We were controlled by those things. We were enslaved to those sins. All we could do was sin because as sinners we were in bondage to sin. Maybe you didn't know that. But everyone who sins, Jesus said, is a slave to sin. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
But the moment that you placed your faith in Jesus, all of that changed. The moment that you trusted Christ for salvation, a wonderful transaction took place in your life. And a wonderful transformation began to take place in your life by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus. Before that, you were apart from Christ. But by grace through faith, you become in Christ. Your old nature was alive and well. But when you came to Christ, your old nature was put to death. Your old nature literally was crucified with Christ on that cross. Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And then he goes on and says, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, for you as well. All we could do was sin. And in place of that old nature that was put to death on the cross, God has given to each one of us a new nature, a brand new nature. That's why Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, he would say that if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creature, a new creation. You're a new creature, you're a new creation because you've received a new nature by grace through faith in Christ. Paul goes on and says, the old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. These are some of the results of what it means to be the elect of God. Look back at verse 12. Therefore, we read, as the elect of God. Notice some of the results of being the elect of God. Well, what does that mean, first of all? The word elect means to be chosen. And in God's plan of redemption, He chose you. He chose you to be saved. Not because of any good work in your life, not because of any personal merit, not because of who you're related to, not because you look good or you smell good. No, he just chose you because of his grace. That God chose us to be saved purely by his grace. It's by grace you're saved through faith in Christ and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. We are not saved by our works or our looks, or our relationships, or any of that, because then we would have something to boast about. But we are not saved like that so that none of us can boast. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2 about our election. He says this, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Get this, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but who have now obtained mercy through faith in Jesus Christ. Peter is not saying that we have replaced God's chosen people of Israel. He's purely pointing out to us that God has chosen to save and to redeem us for his praise and his glory. God has chose, chosen to do that in our lives. You must respond to his call upon your life. But notice in verse 12, as God's elect, as God's chosen, notice what you are in Christ. Do you see it there? First of all, you are holy. Have you thought about that? You're holy. If you are chosen, if you are in Christ, you are holy. And what that word means is it means to be pure. It means to be Morally blameless. The word holy also comes from the word that describes a saint. So if you're in Christ, if you're born again, if you're chosen, if you're in, in Him, you're a saint. Did you know that? Amen. You're a saint. Saint Frank, Saint Jenny, Saint, you know, you're a saint. Now you may not feel like a saint. There's times when we don't feel like we are saints. But that's how God sees you. God sees you as his saint. You see, it's through faith that God has covered you with the righteousness of Christ. And if you can kind of picture this, that here we are, little old us, and we're on this earth, and by grace through faith, that God covers you with the righteousness of Christ. And in that moment of faith, from that moment on, when God looks down from heaven upon you, what does he see? 
He doesn't see you. He sees the righteousness of Christ. And that's why he calls you holy. You're holy because Jesus is holy. And you're holy because he covers you with the righteousness of Christ. That's what it means to be washed in the blood of the Lamb and to be covered with the righteousness of Christ. I like that song, Are You Washed in the Blood? That's the question today. Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been covered with the righteousness of Christ? When that happens, the old you is gone. God doesn't see that anymore. He sees the new you in Christ, covered with the holiness, the perfection, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus himself. The word holy also means to be set apart. And that's what God has chosen to do. In being saved, he sets you apart. For what? Well, the question is better, for whom? He sets you apart for himself. He sets you apart to serve him and to praise him and to glorify him. That's what our lives ought to be as holy people of God. Lives that give praise and honor and glory to the Lord Jesus who saved us, who keeps us saved, and who covers us with his holiness. But notice, secondly, in verse 12, not only does God see you as holy, but notice what else he says. He says, you are beloved. You are beloved. And that word comes from the same word, agape. It's the word that describes God's unconditional love. It describes his love that never changes. His love for you is the same today as it was yesterday and will be tomorrow. God loves you with an everlasting, unchanging love. And because God saved you and because he's made you righteous in his sight in Christ, he sees you as beloved. You are his beloved. You are the one that he chooses to show grace and favor to. Now, how do you know that? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 5 verse 8 that God demonstrates or he proves his love for us. In that what? While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Are you with me this morning? Y'all still aren't on tryptophan, are you? I want to make sure that y'all are still here with me today. That's how God sees us. And he calls us beloved because he's proven his love for each one of us in that while we were sinners, we didn't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. We couldn't buy it. Christ died for us, paid the price of our sin and covered us with his righteousness by grace through faith. That's what you are as God's elect. You're holy and you're beloved. So if you are that, don't you think that we ought to live like that? Don't you think we ought to live like we're different? Don't you think that we ought to live every day like we are holy? Don't you think we ought to live every day like we are actually loved by God? We ought to because that's what we are. That's what God says we are. That's how God sees us. We ought to live like that. We ought to live like the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul goes on here, verse 12 and following, and mentions seven characteristics that we should endeavor to put on. So kind of picture your closet or maybe your dresser and see if these characteristics are maybe hanging in your closet or in your dresser drawer somewhere, just waiting for you to pick up and to put on. As we look at these seven characteristics, each one of these seven traits describes the character of the Lord Jesus. It describes the Lord Jesus to us. And these traits, these characteristics, should portray the new self, the new man, the new nature that we possess by faith in Christ. These ought to be yours as well. Look at verse 12. This first characteristic is simply described as tender mercies. Now, I like this word mercy. Uh, in the Greek, the word is splanknon. And it kind of tickles if you say it right. Can you say it with me? Splanknon. You got to make sure you got to give the emphasis there, splanknon. It kind of makes you feel good. What this word describes for us is, get this, it describes the ache or the pain that you feel deep down in your stomach when you see somebody who's suffering. So if you ever wondered what that was, no, it wasn't what you ate. It's the mercy of God. When you ache for somebody, when you hurt for somebody, it describes how Jesus feels. This word describes for us how Jesus felt when he approached the tomb of Lazarus. 
And do you remember that in John chapter 11? How Jesus and his disciples, they showed up in the town where Mary and Martha, where Lazarus lived. Lazarus had died a few days earlier. He had been in the grave, I think it was for four days. He had been there long enough to where he began to stinketh. You remember as the Bible says? Well, when Jesus, we read in verse 33, saw Mary, and when he saw the Jews and the others that had gathered together at Lazarus' Lazarus's tomb... And they were weeping. The Bible says that Jesus groaned in his spirit. And he was troubled. Jesus splanknoned. That's how he felt. Because tender mercy welled up from within him. Because of the pain and the ache and the grief that those folks felt. And folks, we should groan. We should hurt today for people that are lost in our world. We should groan today for people who are suffering today. Suffering physically and suffering spiritually under the darkness and the depression and the heaviness of sin. We should hurt. We should splengthen on for them. We should ache and groan for them. We should put on tender mercies. Look secondly, verse 12. Not only tender mercies, but we're also to put on kindness. And this word kindness is another word for gentleness. Describes Jesus, where in Matthew eleven thirty three, 33, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you, who are, are, uh, who, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Jesus goes on and says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And then he promises, You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus treated others with gentleness. He was gentle. And he especially treated those who were poor and those who were weak and those who were hurting with gentleness. The Bible talks about how he would not even snuff out a smoldering wick. That's how gentle the Lord Jesus is. He says we should be gentle. Put on kindness. Put on tender mercies. Number three, we should put on humility. Do you see it there in verse 12? And the word humility means to be low-minded. It describes low-mindedness. Now, humility, let's make sure we understand what this is because maybe you've kind of run into people in your life who are kind of proud of being humble. Have you ever, ever run into somebody like that? Humility is not being critical of yourself. Humility is the opposite of being arrogant. And again, humility is how Jesus chose to live. Philippians chapter 2, where we're told Jesus, who being the very form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and, found, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, even to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Jesus humbled himself. Can you imagine the Son of God in the glory of heaven, leaving all of that and becoming man, taking on flesh, and then becoming poor. The Bible says he didn't have a home, no place to lay his head at night. And Jesus humbled himself even further than that by serving us, and even further than that by giving his life for us through the pain and the shame of the cross. Jesus humbled himself. We are to put on humility Number four, we're told to put on, weak, on, put on meekness. And I almost said weakness because I want you to know that meekness is not weakness. That's not what that word means. The word meekness describes strength that is under control. And maybe you've heard this, this illustration before. It describes a horse that has a bridle. And all of us probably recognize or know that horses are very strong. You know, I mean, they can pull plows and carts and whatever, and if you get hooked up in the wrong way, it'll pull you. Uh, my my father-in-law had a horse. And I actually had a, he had two or three horses. And I remember one time he staked out his horse out in, um, it was our front yard, on this metal stob that he drove into the ground, and there was this long rope. And somehow or another, the horse got loose, and I had to grab that rope and get it back on that stop again, and that horse nearly drug me all over the yard. 
But when you put a bridle on a horse, that strength is able to be controlled by the rider. You know, a horse that would go wherever way it wanted, however fast it wanted, the rider can get on the horse, pull on the reins that are hooked to that bridle, and then say, go left, go right, stop, go. Because that's like what meekness is. Meekness is strength that is under control. So in the face of false accusations, maybe in the face of being not only wrongly accused, but even the possibility of losing money or losing your job or even losing your life, is that meekness will allow you to choose to keep your thoughts in check, to keep your tongue under control, to watch your heart and your attitudes and your actions. When you put on meekness, you'll be able to control all of those things. Number five, what we should put on, is described as long-suffering. Do you see it there? This is the last one in verse 12. Put on long-suffering. The word long-suffering means forbearance. It also can be defined as self-restraint. And it's really described as, as endurance. So in the midst of opposition, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of feeling depressed and discouraged, is that long-suffering enables you, it empowers you to endure that, to push through that. Verse 13, we see uh, the sixth thing that we should put on. And it's described as bearing with one another. This word can be described as patience. Bearing with one another personalizes this, this idea of endurance. For you see, bearing with one another is more than just putting up with somebody. You ever had to put up with somebody? You know, and you think, well, you're, try you're, you're trying my patience. You found my last nerve. You ever heard that one? Patience is reaching out to somebody who doesn't deserve it and offering your hand to pick that person up and bearing with him or her as he or she struggles in their life, maybe through some physical thing or maybe through some spiritual thing. We are to put on patience. And then notice seventh in verse 13 that we are to forgive. Do you see it there? Forgiving one another. We should put on forgiveness. And I like this word forgiveness. This word literally means to show somebody grace. That's what it means to forgive. It reminds us that forgiveness cannot be bought. Forgiveness cannot be earned. That forgiveness is given. And how is it given? It's given freely. That forgiveness is to be given freely. And what this means is that whether the person wants it, whether the person needs it, whether the person deserves it, or whether the person doesn't even care, is that we are to offer freely our forgiveness. But remember that forgiveness only becomes effective when it's received. You can forgive and you ought to forgive. It only benefits that person when he or she receives the forgiveness that is freely given. Now go back and think about these seven traits. These characteristics describe Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is all of these things plus more. But these characteristics also describe who we are to be in Christ. These are yours as well. These, tra these traits here remind us of not only what we are to be, but how we are to treat one another. That we should treat each other with these characteristics, with mercy and patience and long-suffering and, and forgiveness and all the others that I, that I just missed. We should treat one another that way. But look at verse 13. Notice what this does. Notice how this affects us. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must forgive. We are to forgive. You know, it only takes one little sin to separate you from God. Did you know that? One little sin. You don't have to, have to even do the big one. One little sin will separate you from God. One little sin will keep you out of heaven. And I don't know about you, but I've got truckloads of sin. We all have committed boatloads of sin, of various types and sizes. 
of various degrees, but yet in the midst of all of that, yet God, in his great love and in his grace, he gave us his only begotten son. And in all of that, yet the Lord Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. He died on the cross for us. And yet, even in that, the Holy Spirit loves you with a great love and has extended grace and faith, revealing to us who the Lord Jesus is, revealing to us who we are without him, and leading us to trust Christ and to be saved. One little sin will keep you out of heaven, but yet, in spite of all of that, God loved us. So what does Paul tell us to do? He tells us to forgive. To forgive others in the same way that you've been forgiven. Do you see it there? Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Have you stopped to think lately about how Jesus has forgiven you? He's forgiven you of every sin, big and little and in between, that he has restored you back to relationship with him, that he has put within your heart the hope of heaven and the joy of eternity, and he's done all of those things and more, and we are to, even as Jesus forgave, we are to forgive. That describes our forgiveness for one another. We must choose to forgive. But consider what happens when you do. When you choose to forgive others, your relationship with others will change. All of our relationships with others as we forgive will take on a total different flavor in a different light. Now, when you choose to forgive others, please remember that you're not saying, come and walk all over me. We don't become a doormat in forgiving other people. But rather, what we do is we become instruments of God's grace. We become instruments of God's mercy in the lives of other people. How is that? Well, consider this. Through forgiveness, as you forgive others, you demonstrate that God forgives. And as you choose to forgive others, you're testifying to other people that God's forgiveness is much greater. God's grace and his love are much greater than what I'm demonstrating for you right now because God is much greater. Even as Christ has forgiven, so we must do the same. Those are the new man's clothes. Look at verse 14. I want you to notice very quickly, secondly, the, the new man's completion. Verse 14, we read, But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Above all of these things, what are these things? These things are the seven characteristics we just read. Paul here in verse 14 is mentioning an eighth characteristic, and it's simply called love. And here we're reminded that love is the supreme characteristic. Love is the supreme trait. It's described in verse 14 to us as the trait that is above all these things. So the love of Christ is what enables and what empowers you to be merciful, to be kind, to be humble and meek and forbearing and patient and forgiving toward others. It's the love of Christ that compels you to do that. It's the love of Christ that empowers you to do that. And we can't get into it this morning, but Paul addresses love more clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And maybe I'd encourage you to read that this afternoon. But if I could just summarize maybe in one sentence what Paul says in a lot of verses here. He says this, If I speak in tongues, if I have spiritual gifts, if I possess all kinds of knowledge, and even if I live by faith, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. Why is that? Because love is the supreme characteristic. Love is the characteristic that is above all of these other things. And he goes on and says, now abide these three things, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? Is love. Love is the greatest because it is supreme. Think about this. One day, tongue speaking will pass away. Spiritual gifts will pass away. Knowledge will pass away. And even faith will pass away because one day we're going to be in the presence of the Lord and we're going to look upon the Lord and see Him in the fullness of who He is. We won't need to have faith because we'll have Him right there. 
and we'll be able to see him and to know him and to hear him. The only characteristic trait that will last forever will be love. That's what will continue on through all of eternity. Love for God and love for one another. Love for God will become more than what we can ever imagine. And love for one another will even take on a, whole, a totally different meaning when we all get to heaven. Verse 14, once again, but above all these things put on love, notice this, which is the bond of perfection. Paul describes love as the bond of perfection, or literally that love is the thing that binds us together or the thing that joins us together. Do any of you remember... Years ago, we used to sing a chorus called Bind Us Together. Do you remember that? When something like, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. He goes on and says, bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. That's exactly right. It's the bond of perfection. You see, it's in love. Love for God and love for one another that our lives take on a total different meaning. Love for God and love for others affects our ministry. Our ministry becomes full. It literally becomes perfect. It becomes complete. That's what that word means. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 13, love one another. He goes on and says, by this, the whole world will know that you are mine if you have love for one another. So we live together, we fellowship together, we serve together, and it ought to be in love. Love ought to be the characteristic that describes who we are and what we do in Christ. Because you see, God works through the love of his people in order to reach a world for the Lord Jesus. So let's go back and talk about our closet again today. What do we need to put off? And when you put that off, don't put it back in your closet. Just go ahead and send it to the trash can. I would even say, don't send it to Goodwill. You don't want somebody else to pick it up. Just throw it away. What do we need to take off? And then, what do you need to put on? What do you need to put on in your life today? Which of these traits that we've just gone through is missing in your life? Or which of those traits you would look at it and say, yep, that one's become thread, threadbare and I need to throw that away and I need to get a new dose of mercy or forgiveness or endurance. What's missing in your life? And then I would ask you, is there someone in your life today that you're having trouble loving or you're having trouble forgiving or you're having trouble putting up with what do you do about that? I would say to you, pray. And I would say to you, surrender your life to Christ again and put on these characteristics and then just tr trust God to take care of the rest of it. He will empower you. He will enable you to be and to live like the Lord Jesus. Oh, that that would be. But you see, that only happens, it only begins when we first come to the Lord and recognize that we're all sinners. And that we're all lost in sin because the Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that all of us are under the wages of sin. That if we remain sinners is that one day that we will be separated from God and cast into a place called hell for all of eternity because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, because God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That whoever would believe in Jesus would not perish, but would have everlasting life. God demonstrates his love for us. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but God's gift to us is eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible simply says that if you will today listen to his voice and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And in that confession... Declare what's in your heart. Believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says you shall be saved. For everyone, whosoever, would call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you saved? And are you living like you're saved? 
That's the invitation this morning. If you're not saved or if you're not sure if you're saved, the invitation is get saved. And then the invitation is begin to put on these characteristics. These sound a lot like the fruits of the Spirit, don't they? Begin to put on these characteristics. And maybe if you're saved today, but you're saying, well, I got two or three of those things in my closet right now, but I'd like to have the other four or five. Maybe the invitation is, Lord, would you work in my life to fully equip my closet and then help me to put it on? And help me to put it on every day. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and give no place or provision in your life to satisfy your flesh. Would you follow Jesus today? That's the invitation. And that's God's invitation to you and me. Let's pray together right now. Every head bowed here and every eye closed in this place. And again, I want you just to go back and think about who is Jesus? He's all of these characteristics and more. What has he done for you? He forgave you. And we are, to be, we are to forgive others as we've been forgiven. And we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're not saved, would you be willing to trust Jesus this morning? And by grace through faith to put him on in your life and allow him to rule and reign over your life? That's the invitation for you. If you're saved, are you living like you're saved? Can others look at you and say, yep, He's saved. She's saved. He or she looks just like Jesus. Just like what I've heard. But if your life doesn't look like that, maybe, you're, maybe the invitation from God to you today is to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And then to forsake all of those things that are part of the flesh for the glory of God. Would you trust Christ to do that in your life today as well? And Father, as we bow before you today, in each of our hearts, we're kind of hidden from one another, but not from you. Our hearts are laid wide open before you like a book. And you see every page. You see every letter. You see every punctuation mark. You see everything about our lives. There's nothing we can hide from you. And so you know in this room who's saved and who's not. You know in this room who's walking with you and who's not. You know in this room who's putting on these garments of Christ and who is not. And how I pray, Lord, that each one of us, we would be able to say that we're clothing ourselves in the Lord Jesus today. Thank you for clothing us in your righteousness. Thank you for making and declaring us to be holy in your sight. And now help each one of us to follow you today. And in following you, that you would be glorified, that you would receive glory and honor and praise, and that others would look at our lives, and we would not receive glory from that, but that you would. That others would see those good works that you're doing in our life and give you praise and honor and glory because it's, it's by you, it's from you. And ultimately, it's all for you. So help that person right now who's not saved and who's struggling with trusting you to be able and willing to do that. To reach out to you and just maybe say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior and I trust you to be my Savior. Come into my life today. I surrender my life to you and save me and make me part of your family. Make me holy and make me your beloved. Maybe there's others, Lord, that have other decisions in their life that they're making. Give grace and courage to do that and then help each one of us that we would follow you. And if that following is something that you call us to do public, give us the courage to do that. And I pray you would receive all the glory and praise as we trust you and follow you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.